Welcome to today's video. Uh, in today's video, we're going to look at something a little bit oddball. So it's the Seiko 60M movement, which was used in the Goldfeather watch. So the Goldfeather came out in the 1960s and was designed as an ultra-thin dress watch. The cases on these are gold filled with 14 karat gold and uh, they are considerably thin. I don't have a measurement on it but I'm sure someone in the comments can probably chime in with how thick these were but uh, they're definitely very thin for what they are. So you're just looking at the dial there and now we're having a look at the back. So the back of the on these is a pop top and that's one of the reasons uh, it, they were able to make the case so thin. So the problem with having a threaded screw back is it, it automatically adds a few millimeters to the um, thickness of the watch. Reason being is you've got to have all that threading in there and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons they use pop tops on a lot of quartz watches in the 1980s was simply just to reduce the thickness of the watch. So anyway, we'll, uh, as we say in Australia, we'll just rip the head off one and get right into it. And uh, we're working on the date side here. Now these movements were a 25 joule movement and they would have been considered pretty high up in the, uh, the hierarchy of, uh, of movement quality at the time. Um, you'll see particularly when we flip it over to the other side that the finish is a bit better than a lot of the Seiko movements from the same time period. And uh, yeah, it, uh, the, the way it runs is quite good actually. So I guess you could consider it as being probably equivalent to a King Seiko um, running wise and so on but uh, yeah so just having a look at it there it's had some water in it before which you can see just at the bottom and the reason behind that is is that the crowns that were used on these were a Swiss style crown so the thing with the Swiss style crown is that they actually have a uh, the rubber o-ring built into the crown and you can't easily replace it and of course what happens over time, the o-ring hardens or it shrinks and you get moisture inside the watch. So that ends up being the death of a lot of these sorts of watches that use the Swiss style crowns. And of course the crowns aren't available anymore. So <clears throat> if, you, if you replace the crown, you don't have an original crown anymore or either that or you can't find one that fits the uh, crown tube properly. So considering these have no calendar on them, the date was pretty simple. And now we've flipped over to the train side. So I'm just taking off the balance bridge there. Now I'm not going to remove any of the shock protector jewel settings here just because it's t far too hard to do on camera and I don't really want to lose anything. So we'll do those off camera later on. However, um, we still get the benefit of the movement coming apart and you can see what's in there. So it's a pretty traditional movement design. The balance bridge is a little bit oddball in that it goes all the way across and is uh, supported on two sides. So the 6138 and 6139 did that, but it's relatively uncommon to see it in the Seiko movements. So we're just removing that carefully there. And I have to be more careful than usual because parts for these are just about non-existent. So if we lose or break anything, we've really got a big problem here. And you can see there it's got quite a large uh, bridge for the pallet fork as well, which is a little bit unusual. And now I'm just working out which way to... I did film this video around six months ago, so I'm a little bit fuzzy, I would say, on... Uh, what I actually did at the time, but yeah, I mean, it's all going to go very smoothly. Yeah, so I've been, uh, I've actually been moving house, so that's what's um, taken me off air for so long, and I've had a lot of my equipment packed up for really since February this year. Um, I kind of did it the silly way, so I sold the property that I was living in, and then bought another one at the same time, so um, the contract that I, I won't bore you too much of the details, but the contract that I signed was subject to sale of the property that I had, and uh, that property took, property took considerably longer to sell than what I expected. So that's really what's just taken me off air uh, for so long and has put me a bit behind in work. 
So just moving through the movement here and it's all in pretty good condition besides the water intrusion on the uh, front of the well depending which way you look at it, the front of the movement um, the rest of the movement was in very good condition so there was nothing really to report and that's good news because as I mentioned before uh, parts are just about impossible to find and where are we up to now so I think we're just about to take the main train bridge off there <clears throat> and shortly you'll see another really odd ball feature in this movement yeah so um, I, I've had a lot a lot of my stuff packed up and it's been frustrating and uh, yeah, eventually we had a very happy buyer uh, purchase the property and then I was able to move into this one uh, in the property that I'm in now, uh, I've actually got a dedicated workshop, which when it's set up properly, I'll do a tour of. But uh, there's a lot more room here to be able to spread out and uh, work the way I should be working. Whereas before, it was just a little bit too pokey for me. And we're just uh, working on getting that bridge off. Yeah, so it's been quite cold in Australia, or in Adelaide anyway. Um, the temperature in Adelaide generally tends to range between um, freaking cold and freaking hot. And the cut over time of the change of temperature is normally about three weeks. So yeah, it's just a place of extremes and pretty much for months it was uh, hot. And then for months it was cold, so it's like 5 degrees overnight and 18 degrees during the day. And yeah, soon it'll be 35 degrees during the day and about 20 degrees at night. But uh, that's just how things roll down here. And I mean, you can put in the jokes about uh, maybe the heat brings out all the dangerous creatures and things like that. But um, yeah, who knows really at the end of the day. So, we're just about to remove that bridge now. It seems to have taken me about forever to get it off, but <clears throat> we're just about there. And so that's the last screw there. And then we take the bridge off. Now you'll see there, they're a fairly simple gear train, so very traditional style of, uh, style of design. And I'll just take the uh, take the wheels out there very carefully because I can't damage them. And I've got one more, and you'll see it's got another odd ball bridge there for the center wheels. So yeah, that's uh, that's a little bit strange. They're normally not like that. And I'm just going to take the other bridge off now, the uh, barrel bridge. From what I recall, there was no real surprises under here. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to as I've said before, I'm going to try and do videos more often. I think really what bogs me down is the editing. So if I do less editing, I think I might be able to get more out. With this one, I, I recorded it a long time ago, and I've actually put on the audio later. I find it a little bit difficult to talk while pulling movements apart. And I think we're struggling with a screw now. <clears throat> it's actually quite hard to do. I've got a new camera set up, um, which is a little bit better, which is why we're getting there. The better picture here um, so I've actually got a macro lens on the end of the camera and it does give me a lot more room to work but it's still pretty cramped and I can't really avoid at the moment getting my fingers in the middle of the shot And now we've got that bridge off, and you can see the barrel there. There's nothing particularly remarkable about it. 
Um, these movements not prone to barrel arbor wear like some of the other ones. And now we're just taking off that center wheel bridge. And again, I'm struggling a little bit just trying to do it under the camera and not have a screwdriver go through a wheel and damage it or anything like that, which is the real risk with this sort of thing. And now that bridge comes off, and you can see it's got a little bit of an oddball set up with the center wheel there, so it's actually got a click uh, that goes on the center wheel. Now, I've never seen that before, even having pulled apart hundreds of movements, so that's a little bit oddball. I'm sure they had a good reason for doing it, though. And I'm just changing screwdrivers there and now we're just taking off the uh, pallet bridge and that's just about the last part on here they're a fairly simple movement and then we've got two more screws to go bridges off and then all we have left is the pallet fork so there's really nothing remarkable about the pallet fork either it's not a funny shape or anything it's very traditional and then we have the complete plate now the shock protector jewels as I said before I'm going to take off off camera because you can easily go awry with those anyway that's it for this tear down and I'm going to try and do more I know I keep saying that but I will try and do more and I'll see you again soon.